chapter 15, Mark chapter 15, if you would please. Now we continue with the rest of the story. If you haven't looked him up, I mean, how many times have I referenced this man, uh, Paul Harvey? Please, if you would, you know, at least listen to one of his, his, uh, his um, I almost said uh, podcast, but that's not what it is. It was his radio show. And uh, that was well before podcasts, let me tell you. And uh, I, I love Paul Harvey, you know. And, and now, the rest of the story. So, Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 15, 15. Let's look at that real quick. Like, and this is a, and when, when the Lord Jesus Christ was standing before Pilate. And, you know, the, Pilate being a, a Gentile has no idea what Jewish custom is. Has no idea that, that uh, you know, the, the Jews were looking to overthrow the Roman Empire of which Pilate was part of. And so as we see here in verse 15, Mark, uh, Mark 15, 15, uh, let's, let's look at, uh, for context, let's look at verse 13 and, and work our way there. Verse 13 says, And they cried out again, crucify him then Pilate said unto them why why what evil hath he done and they cried out the more exceeding crucify him and so Pilate get this willing to content the people released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified This is our Lord Jesus Christ, who deserved none of what he got, but took upon him all of what he got. You know, I tell you that this is what we deserve. We deserve the scourging. We deserve the, the plucking out of the beard and of the hair. We deserve having the crown of thorns put upon our head. We deserve being whipped, beaten, and bruised, being beat up by other men, and some, somebody... Uh, um, uh, mocking you, saying, uh, prophesy unto us who did this. Tell us who did this. If you're the, if you're the Son of God, if you're who you claim to be, then do it, then, then tell us who did that. That's what we deserve. But praise God, He took it for us. Praise God, we, we don't necessarily have to go through the very same things. As it says... So Pilate, willing to content the people. How, how, how worried are you about the people that are around you? How worried are you about this world when they come around you and they're cr and crying out, crucify Him, crucify Him. And you have the, the opportunity to let somebody go that you know is just. And yet to content the people, you put that man to death and you let go the one that you know has done wrong you know has, has killed, murdered, has stolen, has, has done horrible, atricious things, you have the power in your hand to say, kill him or let him go free. Imagine being Pilate at that point. Imagine having all these people, the throng of people around him saying, crucify him, crucify him. And knowing he was a just man. Because after that, he goes to the water and he washes his hands at the laver and says, His blood be upon you. I am clean of this man. Pretty sad though, he had the power to let him go. How about us? We have the power to let other people go too. We have the power to tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the opportunity given to us how many times a day? How often do we get in contact with other people around us? And we have the opportunity to either let them go or be crucified, killed. Because when they get killed, they go to a devil's hell. But when we let them go, when we, set, when we make them free, not set them free, we make them free by the gospel. It isn't by our words. It isn't by anything that we could do outside of telling them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet it's still their decision 
to accept or reject it. Jesus, being God, could have said, no, I'm out. You know, he could have. But he didn't. Praise the Lord. But Pilate wanted to content the people. Who here likes having an angry mob around them? What, what, what would you do to content the people so that you could get away? So that you wouldn't have to worry about that mob coming after you if it's only one person. It's just in one person. What, what's their life to me? I, why should I care? It's just one person. Imagine being in that angry mob. Imagine being those people who he, if, if, if anything, he healed. He cured. They heard his teachings. They knew who he was. And yet they stand there with the rest of the crowd. Who's the leader of that crowd is my question. We know who the leaders are. Amen, brother. It's like, I know the devil's in the electronics. Amen. Amen. Do you need me to shut this off and go with that? I'm good. Okay. All right. Well, let me know if I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I know that. All right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Come on, I'm going to preach it. All right. Um, it is appointed on men, and men wants to die and after this judgment, and, and, and the list goes on and on. But anyway, I digress. Imagine being in that, in that, in that mob. Do you think there are some people in that mob that knew as well? Do you think there's people that were in that, that, that group of, 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 of these individuals that have come before Pilate yell and crucify him, and yet you knowing he was a just man, he was a righteous man, he was a perfect man, there was no evil in him, and yet you're screaming out just as much as they are, crucify him. What would you do to be content? What would what 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 would would cause you to be content in that situation? Would it be to see a just man get killed, or would it would it would it be to see a a a, a man who you know was a murderer, who know was a was a thief, who who you know had done wrong? Does God want anyone to die? And I mean the second death. Because my Bible says He doesn't. My Bible says that He wants all to repent. And none that, sh that none should perish. This is His desire. He doesn't want anybody to have to die. Praise God, He Himself put, him in the, put Himself in that place. Well, let's continue on if you would. Let's go to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3. You're going to see Jesus' own words here. Luke chapter 3 and verse 14. Actually, these are John's words. John the Baptist. Now, we had been going through John the Baptist, and I believe I got through uh, the Luke portion of John the Baptist. And so we see there were these people that came before John. And as we look at... Um, let's look at uh, starting in verse 12. Luke three twelve. The Bible says, Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master... What shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. Now that's not easy for a publican. You know the publican was a tax collector, right? And that's how they made their money, is they collected the taxes and they added on a little bit more so that they could have a little, you know, a little extra in the palm, if you know what I'm saying. So, I'm not going there. I could I could take this off into a whole nother realm but I won't because I think you know where I'm going with that. But he goes on to verse, uh, verse 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? Now you're talking, you have tax collectors here that are going to be baptized by John the Baptist. Now there's a reason why they're coming to be baptized. And it's the remission of sins at, the, at this time. This was the way they showed their remission of sins. This is, you know, by the washing of the water. And so, you have publicans that came. You have soldiers that came. They both know they've done wrong. They both know that they've, they've committed uh, something against a holy and righteous God. 
I hope you have. I hope you realize that. I hope that's what, what got you to salvation is knowing that you're a sinner and you needed saved by grace. It isn't anything that you could have done. It isn't the fact that, well, I don't want to go to hell. I just want to go to heaven. Hey, there's much more to it than that. You have offended a holy and righteous God. Don't forget, that's exactly why we get judged. But he continues on, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man. Now, let me ask you this. Is that easy for a soldier? I mean, Chuck and I have been in the military. Anybody else been in the military here? Or been in a military family and knew a little bit about the military? Okay. All right, praise the Lord. So you know it's not an easy task for to tell a soldier, do no harm, when it comes to a time of war. Let's continue on. But I can tell you, that this is not a time of war. The Jews were not rebelling against the Roman government. And so, and, and of course, the, the Jewish uh, government and the Roman government were in co uh, coercion, or not, no, that's not the word. Uh, but they were working one with another at the time. They had to. The Roman government kind of forced them to. But even so, they're still soldiers of the, of the Jewish sect. And so, you had, um, at this time, being that there's no, uh, there, there's no war, John rightly said, let me find it, do violence to no man. They were known to be violent people. They were known, this is, this is why they, they did what they did to Jesus. This is what scourging was all about. This is what crucifixion was all about. It wasn't a Jewish rite. This was a Roman rite. This is what the Romans did. It isn't what Jews did. Jew, Jews didn't usually do this. This was Romans that did this, that would crucify them, that would scourge them. And so he goes on to say, and, uh, uh, and, and, and he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. So there's three things you, you, you see here. Number one, do harm to no man. Number two, don't falsely accuse somebody just so you can have your jollies out of it. And number three, he says, be content with your wages. Hey, shouldn't we do the same thing, though? If, if you're told be content with your wages, shouldn't we be okay with what we get? Why do we, why do we think we deserve to have $15, $20, $25? Hey, let's, let's go to $50 minimum wage. Do you know how many places you're going to put out of business doing that? All your small mom and pop places that that uh, are going to give you the service can you uh, there's a difference between going to walmart and save a lot is there not there's a big difference you you get some personal service and save a lot walmart they could care less they're walking around just doing their thing and you're just another number let's go to a man's world in in in, in a man's warehouse two different places one's a large system man's world is a a small local place you're going to get a little more personal uh, attention at a small local place than you are a bigger place. And so let's, let's look at the $50 uh, you know, minimum wage or even $20 minimum wage. You're going to put these places out of business. That's exactly what's going to happen. But I digress. I didn't even mean to go there. But even John tells the soldiers, the soldiers, be content with your wages. What do you think they got for their wages? Anybody heard of salt? Many of them got salt for their wages. Can you imagine? Salt was precious in that day. Today, it's just normal everyday thing that we get. Back then, it wasn't. They had to preserve all their f food with salt. They didn't have refrigerators. I hope you realize that. I hope you know that they didn't have refrigerators 2,000 years ago. They didn't, they didn't have, listen, they didn't have the old, they didn't even they didn't have the old ice boxes. Okay? You're in, you're in Israel. You're not going to find a whole lot of ice around. So how else were they going to preserve their meats? Well, salt. How else were they going to pr preserve the, the, the majority of the things by salt? That's how important salt was in that day. 
And then when he says, be content with your wages, but all I get is salt. Yeah. But there's a reason for that. Because you can be preserved by that salt. Does not the Bible say we are to be salt and light of this world? Sure does. So, question is, are you, are you content with your wages? Are you content with making eight, nine, ten dollars an hour? Are you content with thirty, forty dollars an hour? Are you content with what you get? Or do you feel you have to have that much more? Where does your contentment lie? Now it is a lie. Does the Lord has the Lord not provided you with some great things in your life? And yet, we're never content. I have to have more. That wasn't enough. It wasn't good. You know, it was good enough right then and there. But today's a different day. You know, radio was fine 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Then the black and white television came out. Then, then we had to have color television. And now we have to have HD TV. And, and the list goes on and on, does it not? Now, I remember the days when we had rabbit, ear, rabbit ears. Anybody remember rabbit ears? Amen? Okay, a few of you do. Praise the Lord. Then it went to the big antennas on the houses, right? And we could get two, four, and seven. Praise the Lord! That was great! And then they came out with cable. But that wasn't good enough. Yeah? Now we have to have Hulu and, and all the other, you know, uh, other things that are out there. YouTube TV. Why are we never content? Why are we always looking for something bigger and better all the time? Because I believe that our contentment is not in the Lord. I believe our contentment is with this world. More times than not. Let's look at, uh, uh, let's see, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. If anybody remembers Gepic, Pastor Mills was big into Gepic, and uh, we went through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Well, we're in the P part of, of the Gepic. And uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, please. Philippians 4, 11. Now, I like 8 myself. I'm a big fan of verse 8. But I'm not going there. Because I'll be there all night. Or I could be. But verse, uh, let's, let's start in verse 10 to get the... the the context verse 10 says but i rejoiced in the lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again wherein ye were also careful but ye lacked opportunity not that i speak in respect of want for i have learned in whatsoever state i am say these last four words with me therewith to be content are you content with where you are and what you do? Are you content in what the, where the Lord has placed you in this day and age, at this time? I know it's Bradford. I know it seems to be the armpit of America. I know that, that nothing happens around here. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're left out in the middle of nowhere. But can I tell you, that's not a bad place to be nowadays. I'd much rather be here than New York City. I'd much rather be here than... than, than uh, uh, Washington or Oregon where they had all the I, I'd much rather be here than any of the big cities I'd much rather be here than any of the bigger campuses can, can you imagine being around these campuses that are having these these protests shall I say I can't imagine what that would be like and then and then having my children in that campus I I love the one one commentator for I believe it's Fox News. No, I'm not a big Fox News person. Don't get me wrong. But I happen to catch this on, on YouTube, of course. And she goes, if that were my kid, he'd have two options. Number one, either you pack up your stuff and you come home in six hours. Or I'm coming to get you and you're not going to want that, certainly. So either you pack it up and get home or I'm coming to get you. I hope you do the same thing. I hope you do the same thing for your child. Listen. You're paying them people. Those, you know, I, I mentioned it this morning. Those uh, professors, you know, the, the higher learning doctors. Can I tell you what, 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 what a joke? Literally, what a joke. 
you're paying them to go protest against something that should have nothing to do with their education. It's all about opinion and how they feel. It's got nothing to do with the reality of what you're learning in school or what you're supposed to be learning in school. It's not about your feelings. It's about your knowledge and what you're supposed to be gaining from those higher learning areas. But yet, but yet, we're seeing this in your large camp. What, what bothers me, who knows what I mean when I say Ivy League schools? All right, we're talking Yale, Harvard, Brown, um, Princeton, okay. Did you realize those were started by churches? Those were religious institutions when they first started. They had nothing to do with the secular world. In fact, if you look at their charter, the original charter, it'll tell you that the reason they're there is to learn the Word of God that they might go evangelize this world about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly why those higher learning institutions are out there. It had nothing to do with what the secular world has for us today. But yet, somewhere along the line, from the time they started till today, they took a wrong turn. They've turned their back against God and said, we'll do it the world's way. I know. Preacher, you preach so hard. Praise God, you guys enjoy it. I hope you do. Um, anyway, i got to keep going. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Now we saw 6.6 6 last, uh, earlier this, uh, this morning. I believe it will say yes. But now we're looking at 6.8. So let's start at 6.6 and work our way through the 6.8. By the way, their sermon is brought to you by Squirt Zero. All right. <laughs> there will come a day. But anyway, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6 <clears throat> says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. I preached on that this morning. I already went through that, so I'm not going to take you through it in nauseam. But verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we cannot and we can carry nothing out. Know what you have in this world is going to stay in this world. It is not going to carry on with you after you're dead. This is where the Egyptian tombs and stuff have gotten it all wrong. They took all their gold and all their, all their riches and all, their, all their, their, their worldly goods and they put them in this tomb merely to rot because they thought they were going to have something with them when they went to the other world. Even, even back then, they knew there was, there was something more to this, to this life. They knew it, this, this wasn't just the end. They knew there was something more to it. That's why they had these huge tombs. That's why they, they decided that they were going to bring down all this. Because they knew that there was something better or something more coming. I shouldn't say better. Because obviously they didn't think it was going to be better. This is why they had to bring their riches with them. Can I tell you, whatever's here is left here. Your house, your car, your, 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 um, your, your goods, your, 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 your toys... All that's going to be left behind. Now my Bible says, lay up treasure in heaven where rust and moth doth not corrupt. Don't lay your treasures here in this world where it will. But as we continue on, let's look at verse 8. Would you read this with me all together, starting with, and having ready begin. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Hmm. You mean I have to be content with just the food and the clothes that I have on my mat? That's what I, I should be content with? Yes, because you can't take it with you. Whatever you have here is going to be left behind. It isn't going to be taken with you. It isn't going to be carried along into the, into the next run. It isn't going to be. It's going to be left here. This is why he says with food and raiment, be, be content. Hey, be happy that you have clothes on your back be happy that you have food in your belly can you imagine going through the wilderness 40 years and their clothes never rotted off them and in fact obviously they could wear the same clothes all the time never had to change you know, never never had to to 
uh, tighten the belt, or, or they, I, my guess is they probably never lost a whole lot of weight. Why? Because God knew that they had to wear those clothes the whole time. Could you imagine what that would be like? 40 years. It's so out of style. I don't want to wear that. Why, why would I want to wear bell bottoms? It's 2040. Well, not really. It's 2024. But anyway, you get the... But it, <laughs> amazingly, it's coming back, isn't it? You should have kept that stuff. You might have been wearing it again. You know, I'm just saying. What? The polyester suits and, you know, I mean, come on. It's coming back. So why aren't we content? Why do we have to, why do we have to follow the world's way? Why, why, do we, why is there always got to be something better, something bigger, something grander? Why does it have to have flashy lights and, and moving parts all the time? Boy, Satan has really got a hold of our mind, doesn't he? You, let's go to the school sometime. They can't sit still for two seconds. Why? They have to have something flashing on the screens all the time. They have to have something, somebody moving or somebody... Listen, I, when I was in school 45 minutes, you sat there and you didn't dare move. You didn't. Teacher can under... No! Shut your mouth. <laughs> I'd be like that. You know. Uh, anyway. You know I would too. Anyway, let's continue on. Hebrews chapter 13, please. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Can you believe we're almost done? Hebrews 13, 5. I have one more verse after this. And all God's people said, Amen. I will be done on time tonight. I promise you that, if not sooner. Amen. And so if anybody's asking, if you're thinking about out, out there on YouTube and Facebook, if you're thinking about coming, come Sunday nights. I keep it shorter. Amen. Oh, listen, I've been trying to do it Sunday mornings. For some reason, I cannot. I'm just saying. So, you know, if, if you want a shorter ser service, come Sunday nights. Come Wednesdays. Hey, you want to talk about? Mm, that's a perfect day. Amen. Hebrews 13.5, if you would, please. Listen, we're talking about contentment. You want to be content? You want to just come for, for short service? Hey, Sunday night's the, way, the time to come. Amen. I'm going to put a plug in there. Then Wednesday night's even better. Praise the Lord. All right, let's continue. <laughs> let's continue on. Hebrews 13.5, please. <clears throat> the Bible says, let me get to 13.5 and not 12.5. I almost did it. 13.5 says, let your conversation be without covetousness. That means your manner of life. Don't be covetous in this life. Don't, don't be, listen, don't be looking at, at what the world has and say, well, i got to have that too. Quit trying to keep up with the Joneses, the Johnsons, or whoever the Jays are next to you. Quit, quit trying to, to follow in with the world and, and try to be like the world. Listen, you're supposed to be different. There's supposed to be something about you that, hey, there's a, there's a, there's a calm, there's a peace, there's a contentment about them. Why is that? Because the Lord told me I need to be content with food and raiment. Anything else is a bonus. But we don't look at it that way. We think we have to have the bigger, better thing. Well, let's continue. I'm not even done with that. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be, what is that next word? Content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Huh. Interestingly, he would put that verse that we use all the time when we're talking about troubles, tribulations, trials, difficulties. We're always talking about he, he promised he will never leave us nor forsake us. But look at the context of this. It's about the things that you have. It's about the contentment you, ought, you should have and you ought to have in the Lord. Why? Because he, has never leave you, he will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll be with you through the, through the tough times and the, and, and the easy times. But be content with what you have. That's why he told the people in the wilderness in that day. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He promised those that were in the wilderness, I'm going to be there with you the whole time. But yet, were they ever content? 
They always had a problem. They always had a railing accusation, not only against Moses, but against God Himself. Well, that didn't go very well for them, did it? Why don't we learn from that? This is why the Old Testament should be just as important to us as that New Testament. Why? Because it teaches me. It teaches me that, listen, what they went through the wilderness, hey, I may be going through my, myself right now. I may be going through a difficult time. I may be going through a tribulation. I may be going through a trial in my life. But God says, be content with what you have. Because I will never leave you, nor will He forsake you. It's good to know we have a God who loves us so much that He put Himself out there so often. And He said He'd never leave you, but yet how often we say, where are you, Lord? Why is this going on, Lord? Why am I having such difficulty, Lord? God says, be content. Because you're not content is why you're having these, tri these problems, these tribulations, or what you think are. Again, a lot of it has to deal with perception. Is it really a problem in your life, or is it just because you're not content with what you have? But I've got to have it. Or in the Bible, does it say you have to have it? It says, be content with your raiment, meaning what you're wearing, and your, and your meals, your food. Now listen, i got a belly full. Praise the Lord. I don't think many of us are going that hungry. At least not in here, not today. So why aren't we content? Why do we, why do we hold to the world's standards of what contentment is? Can I tell you, the world will never be content. Let me say that again. The world will never be content. They'll always be murmuring and complaining. They'll always be looking for the bigger, better thing. Always. Why? Because Satan has blinded their minds. He'll, he doesn't want them to realize how good they have it. He wants them to think, oh, I gotta have more. I gotta have more. I gotta get more. I gotta make more. I gotta do more. When God says, be content. Be content with what you have. Quit looking for more. Quit looking. What are you, who are you looking for for your contentment? What are you looking for for your contentment? Lastly, if you would, 3 John. 3 John, verse 10. As I mentioned in Sunday school this morning, I'll mention again, if you have more than one chapter in 2, 3 John, or Jude, please show me. I would love to, I would love to see that Bible. Because I think we got issues. We got some splaining to do, Lucy. Anyway, 3 John, verse 10. Probably the, long, probably the longest verse in 3 John. And of course, this is the one I'm going to preach on. Amen. John says, Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words. Mm. Be careful of your words. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. Oh, be careful, little tongue, what you say. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful, little tongue, what you say. He says, I will remember. He goes on to say, and, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbidding, or forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Let's back up a couple uh, verses here. Let's actually back up just one verse into verse 9. Can you imagine John the Apostle wants to come to church? He wants to be part of the congregation. He wants to, listen, he's got a word to tell you from the Lord. Now, if anybody does, John does. And yet, you have this gentleman, and I use that term loosely, who is withholding him from coming to that church, saying, I don't want him here. Could you imagine? You could have John the Apostle come into your church and you say, I don't want him here. The, the, the man who's writing the rest of of canon of Scripture, and you tell him you don't want him there. 
Wow. Talk about audacity. Talk about holding yourself in high esteem. Verse 9 says, I wrote unto the church. This is, this is John, John the Apostle. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. What is this preeminence? Who, who here knows when, when a, a, a king or, or somebody high in, in, in the ranks of royalty is called eminence? You do realize that, right? This is talking about preeminence. This is talking about he, he wants to be the one that, that has that, that high esteem, that, that, that has that, that high look, that proud look. Oh, there, isn't there a verse in there about uh, a proud look, a lying tongue? Isn't there, isn't there a proverb that says something about that? Isn't there something that says God hates it? You say, oh, God doesn't hate nothing. Baloney. You better look that up because that's exactly what it says. Six things, yea, seven things God hates, and that is one of them. A proud look. Can you imagine Diotrephes? He is withholding the man of God who had his head on Jesus' chest, listening to his heartbeat. And you're telling me you would say, no, I, I don't want him in here. I'm more important than he is. My eyes would be bugging out of my head right there if somebody were to tell me that. But he goes on to say, wherefore, if I come, because John still wanted to come, his, his de desire was still to go to that church. And he says, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them. So not only was he content about railing on them, about making accusations against them, against them. Excuse me. But he wasn't content with that. That wasn't enough. Okay, it wasn't enough just to to speak harshly about them, to to actually lie against them. That wasn't enough. But he also says, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren. He won't even receive us. He won't even bring us in. He, he won't even listen to what we have to say. And forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. There were people that wanted John to come. There were people saying, oh, please, John, if you would, please come. We want to hear what you have to say. You're the last apostle. You're the one writing the last of the Scripture. You're the one that, that was with Jesus. We want you here. And Diotrephes stood here behind the pulpit and said, I want you out of here. Get out. I don't want your kind here. You're too busy following him. You won't follow me, but you'll follow him. Get out of here. You think I preach hard. And I do. But could you imagine that man? I have never told anybody here, I want you out of here. At least I hope not. If I have, please let me know. It's awfully quiet. Anyway, can you imagine, though, the audacity of Diotrephes that would say, if you, if you want him here, I don't want you here. Get out. You think John couldn't start a new church? You know, how, how difficult would it be for John to say, hey, just come with me. I'll, I'll get you started on the right way. Why do you think we have so many denominations today? Why do you think we have so many splits today? Can, can, can you imagine in that day, that, that's what you would call a church split right there. That's what you would call a, 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 somebody that, that is trying to say, I am God and, and there is no other and you do what I say or you get out. That's a dictatorship. God isn't into dictatorships. He's into leadership. But he's not into dictatorship. That is dictatorship to me. Now please, if, if I'm wrong, somebody tell me. Otherwise, not right now, but later on. But this is what I see a dictator doing. This is what I see people like Mussolini and, and Hitler. This is what I see them doing. But instead of telling them, go away, no, you're dead. 
plain and simple. In, in, in otherwise, he's saying, you're dead to me. Get out of here. I, I don't like your kind. I don't, I don't think that, that you're my, my people. You're too busy following the, the man of God who walked with Jesus, who was at his cross, who saw everything that Jesus went through and actually ran to the tomb, but Peter just walked inside first because he didn't dare to run inside. He was at all those things. And yet the man, Diatrophes, dare I call him Pastor Diatrophes, says, I don't want him here. I'd, listen, I'd much rather have John here than me here. I'd, I'd rather have John the Apostle standing here telling you what happened to him when he was walking with Jesus than myself standing here if he has the Word of God in and through him. If he's going to teach you what the Word of God had to say, I'd rather him stand here and tell you than for me to stand here and read this to you. He was there with him. Who would not want him there? It's only somebody that is prideful, is full of themselves, who says, well, they're not of us. What do you mean they're not of us? He was with Jesus who said, upon this rock I will build my church. Can you imagine what that... I can't imagine the audacity of this man. But how many of them are, are out there today? How many of them are out there saying, I, I, I won't have that guy in my church? How many would, would how many preachers out there have you ever heard say, if you're not if, if you're not with me, then I want you out of here. If 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 you're if you're if you want to follow somebody like John, who truly knows scripture, because he's writing scripture, and says, I don't want him here. And those of you that want him here, get out. Wow. What are you content with? It says he wasn't even content with, with speaking bad about the man. He threw people out because of it. Where does your contentment lie? What are you content with? Are you worried about what this world holds? We sing the song, this world's not my home, but do you believe it? Or, and do you live it? Or is it your home? Is this what you live for? Praise God you're here tonight. Amen for each and every one of you. I, I praise the Lord. But the question is, and it's something that you have to deal with God about, Am I content with what I have? Am I content with what Jesus told me and what, what the, the Scripture tells me? Am I content with these things? Or is there something that I desire more? Because if there is, find out what that contentment is. It needs to be Jesus. It needs to be the, the good things that He is giving you. But yet, how often we say, no, nope. no, nope, I need more. I have to have more I need, I need, I need a, a financial stability. I need a house. I need two good vehicles. I need, I need, I need, I need. No, you want. What you need is what God says you need. You need salvation. You need food and raiment. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Why don't we simplify our lives a little bit? Why, why, don't, we, why don't we cut back on, on what this world holds and say, Maybe I really don't need that. Maybe I'll be okay with the with the the, the, the little that I have. Well, why don't you praise God for the little that you have? Quit quit not you know. How does that saying go? Don't um, instead of having or this is this is what being rich is. Instead of having what you want, want what you have. Let me say that again. Instead of having what you want. Why don't you want what you have? Be content with what you have. Because God has told us, if you're content with what you have, I'll, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content in, in Him. Not in me. Good grief. Don't, don't look at me. 
I'm not going to you know, make you content. But he can. His word should. Praying to him should. This is, this is where your contentment should lie. Not in a man, but in him. In God and his word. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time together. Lord, again, I, I, I just... I pray I'm not too hard, Lord. But we need to learn that contentment cannot lie in this world. It has to rely on you. It has to rely on your word. It has to rely on the good and perfect things you have given us. And you told us in your word that we need to be, need to be content with food and raiment that we have. But Lord, I pray that our contentment, our true contentment, the inner, inner man contentment, the, the, the turmoil that, 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 that can be squashed by You, Lord, I pray that we would be content with You. Again, thank You so much, Lord, for Your love and Your mercy. Let us be content in Your grace and in Your long-suffering. Because if we're not content with You, we'll never be content with anything in this world. Lord, I pray that we would take that song as we sing it. We think, we think so, so much of it, but yet, do we truly believe that this world's not our home? We're just passing through. Why do we desire so much more than just you? Lord, I know, and you told us life would be tough. You said there would be tribulation. You said there'd be difficulties. But Lord, let us find our contentment in you and not in this world. Not in the devil, not in our flesh, but in you. Again, Lord, thank you for your love, mercy, grace, long-suffering. I say it time and time again, but how true that is. How much we need those things. And God, may we worship you in spirit and in truth. May we hold you in high esteem in our lives. May we emulate the Lord Jesus Christ with our life. And Lord, may we be salt and light to this world who truly needs it. Lord, this world is not content at all with anything. Let us find our contentment in you. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.